Welcome to Myers Park Baptist Church. We are a people on a journey of faith who are bold in spirit and open to all. Our mission is to be an inclusive community for spirituality and social justice. And we are so excited that you are joining us this Sunday. Today, we continue worshiping virtually. And although we are physically distant, we find hope in the strides being made to get many of us to a place of health and wholeness. We also remain prayerful, holding space for those who are still losing loved ones, those dealing with symbolic griefs, and those who have been affected the most in our communities. May God be with us as we press toward a new tomorrow. We offer this service today from Catawba land. The Catawba people have tended lovingly and sustainably to this land for generations. They call themselves the people of the river because they've always lived along this particular watershed. It is their longest and most cherished relationship. We recognize the Catawba people and acknowledge that they are still here. We offer our deep gratitude to them for being the host people of the land we worship on and for their stewardship of this place we call home. A few quick announcements before we begin. Next Sunday is Earth Sunday. Reverend Dr. Ben Boswell will be preaching and award-winning musicians Jim Brock and Chad Lawson will be offering musical selections. You don't want to miss it. Immediately following service at 11.15 a.m. on all of our streaming channels, I invite you to join us for a special conversation with Dina Gillio Whitaker of the Colville Confederated Tribes. She is an award-winning journalist and columnist. Dina is also a lecturer of American Indian Studies at California State University, San Marcos. She is an independent consultant and educator on environmental justice and other indigenous policy-related issues. Dina Julio Whitaker is the author of As Long As Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. We are so excited to welcome her virtually as we continue to awaken to issues of earth and indigenous injustice in this country. This will be streamed on YouTube and Facebook, so please bring your questions to the chat. We are excited to welcome you to our outdoor worship experience on April 25th, right here on our lawn. We have missed worshiping with you. This service will feature music by Randy Franklin and the Sardines, a sermon by Dr. Boswell and socially distant fellowship. Please make sure you register online and remember masks are required. Finally, we are thrilled to welcome you to in-person worship on May 23rd, right here in our sanctuary for Pentecost Sunday. Things will be a little different when we are together again. Registration will be required to maintain safe numbers and masks must be worn at all times. Attendance in the sanctuary will be limited to 150 people, and all attendees must have their name and age present on the registration. Child care will be available for children five and younger, and registration, again, is required. We look forward to reuniting with you over the coming weeks. This concludes our announcements for this morning. As always, please visit our website, follow us on social media, and make sure you are subscribed to our weekly news emails. There is so much happening in the life of our church, especially as we begin to safely reunite. So we want you to be a part of all of that. Now let us continue to worship together in spirit and in truth. Amen. 
His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. His music in the sinner's ears, His life and health and the peace. He speaks and listening to His voice, the dead receive the mournful broken hearts rejoice the humble poor believe my gracious master and my friend assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth of blood This time, we want to take a moment to welcome all of you who are worshiping with us. Far or near, we are glad that you have chosen to spend this time with us. If you are our guest or you have never taken the opportunity to share your information with us, would you please text the word GUEST to 474747 and a member of the ministerial team will reach out to you soon. At this time, we also invite everyone to text the word PEACE to someone you know. The New Testament reading today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of God. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that God has set, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, People of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. But I heard a voice 
Happy Easter, beloveds. Yes, yes, I hear some of you through the screen telling me that Easter is over. It was last week, Mia, what are you talking about? As a kid, I had no idea Easter continued beyond Resurrection Sunday. Once the Easter candy went on sale at the drugstore, to my delight, I thought that was a wrap on Easter. <laughs> I had no idea that there were other holy days after Easter, that there were other Jesus stories that needed to be told, that witnesses were reborn in this time. The call to witness on Jesus's behalf becomes ever clearer in this season following the resurrection. In the church culture of my upbringing, when the preacher was in the heart of their sermon, they'd often solicit a verbal response. Call and response is a major part of the sermonic experience in many black churches. There is an expectation that you gonna say something back to the preacher. You better let that preacher know you're alive, that the preaching isn't one-sided. Sometimes when the message was getting good to the preacher, they'd yell out from the pulpit, can I get a witness up in here? Y'all don't hear me, can I get a witness? In other words, can somebody in here testify to what I am saying? Can there be evidence of the power of what I am saying and the power that works beyond what I am saying? Can I get a witness? As important as the empty tomb is to the foundation of faith for many who claim to be Christian, there was always so much more to follow. There was so much more to witness. There are 50 days in Eastertide, or what I like to call witness tide, a period which includes Easter Sunday as well as other Sundays. During Eastertide, we are reminded that after Jesus' resurrection, he visited with his disciples. He broke bread with them. He drank with them. He met them on a beach. I can't wait to do that. He helped their unbelief. His visits made them witnesses to the power of the creator that could be carried forth in the world. 
I imagine Jesus reappearing to his friends with his arms stretched wide, with the holes in his hands and abdomen showing, saying, can I get a witness up in here? I imagine him appearing to his beloved Mary Magdalene saying, can somebody testify to what God has done? Jesus visited and Jesus restored hope. And if there has ever been a season when we could use a visit from him, it would be now. Amidst the violence that rocks us daily, the injustices that keep many hanging on to life by a thread, we could use a little witnessing up in here. We could use a little hope. We could use a visit. I remember being visited by my late grandmother Myrtle in a dream last summer. She wore an emerald evening gown with a necklace and earrings as she stood in my aunt's living room. I remember it like it was real, her appearing to me, calling my name as I peeked out from the back bedroom. Her caramel skin glowed in dim lighting and I walked toward her with a smile that said, I've been missing you my whole life. Just as I approached her for a hug, the dream ended. Just as I was getting used to her resurrection moment, her reappearance after 30 years, I was jolted awake, both comforted and confused. She isn't the only ancestor to visit me. Most of these dreams end in a similar fashion. Just as things are warming up, just as you are settling into this new reality, everything shifts. You wake up sometimes discombobulated, maybe grasping for breath, maybe smiling as you reminisce, maybe with tears welling up in your eyes because the dream was all too brief. You awake and you may sit up in bed staring into space. Or if you're like me, you open up your notes app on your phone and capture the details. And, and sometimes you try to force yourself back to sleep, hoping to pick up where you left off, hoping you could have just one more moment with them, just one more moment with grandma, just one more moment in whatever paradise they are now residing. And then you wonder, what did they want with you anyway? Why did they return only to cut the visit short? It is in this longing and this questioning that we step into this Easter story. It is not a story of resurrection, but of commissioning and sudden departure. We meet Jesus and his disciples mid-conversation in the opening scene of Acts. One of them asks, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? As usual, they are eager for answers from their leader. Jesus replies, it is not for you to know the times or the periods, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. This seems like fairly common Jesus talk. He's uttered similar things before. This visit must have felt familiar to the disciples. It must have been comforting to hear from their friend, to hear their friend talk this way, even if he was saying things they did not yet understand. But just as there is about to be a happily ever after, just as they are getting into the deep philosophical musings, there is a disruption. The rug is pulled from beneath their feet and they are shaken awake. The writer says, when Jesus had spoken, as the disciples were watching, Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Just as they are becoming reacquainted, just as they are living into the wonder of the resurrection, Jesus leaves. 
Today, the ascension is honored 40 days into the season of Easter and falls on a Thursday, which is why many of us have never truly sat with the ascension, not in the same way that we sit with the birth or the resurrection. How is it that the issue of the body, it being born, it being broken, brutalized, and raised from death ceases to be of comparable importance when it comes to the body being taken up to a great beyond. I will put the question of whether or not the ascension actually happened aside for this sermon. As the late Reverend Bill Doles reminds us in his book, just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it isn't true. The truth is something happened with Jesus' body or spirit or both. Something happened that initiated the continuation of a movement even in his physical absence. And early church leaders thought it interesting enough to highlight during this season. Religious scholar Anthony DuPont reminds us that The Easter mystery as a whole was celebrated in the 50 days following Easter. But distinctions came into being in the fourth century and by Augustine's time, the evolution was complete. Essentially, Augustine, an early church father, would argue for separate celebrations for Ascension and Pentecost. More recent church calendars suggest that the honoring of the ascension be moved to the Sunday before Pentecost so that it has greater visibility. In this season of Easter, this season of witness, it is common to rush off into the later chapters of Acts that cover the works of the apostles, all the people they brought into the community, all the miracles they performed, but beloved, Before I allow us to rush off into that, I'd argue that we need to sit with the ascension. We need to sit with what it must have felt like for the disciples to witness their leader be murdered, his body to go missing, his reappearance in various scenes, and then his sudden departure. All in the matter of 40 days, they say. This is not to skip over the stories of Jesus' appearances. I, I know some of you are dying to hear yet another sermon about doubting Thomas. (laughs) Uh, There was great doubt related to his resurrection. Many of the disciples, including Mary and Peter, didn't even recognize Jesus at first. Yet I imagine that there was also great comfort upon the realization that their rabbi and friend, their brother and leader had returned to them. I imagine that some of them let out a sigh of relief. Jesus, thank God you're back. I thought we were going to have to do all this work by ourselves. There must have been relief, maybe even joy as Jesus revealed himself. Yet when the work was done, when the revelation had run its course, he was brought up into the clouds. The writers say the disciples stood there gazing toward heaven. Perhaps they were perplexed. Had they ever seen an ascension before? Maybe they were as bewildered as I was after my grandmother's visit last summer, thinking, what did he visit us for only to leave us so suddenly? Perhaps they once again felt abandoned. What was the point of all of this, they might ask. Anthony DuPont offers that according to Augustine, Christ's ascension is important for the life of every Christian. His ascension provides the church with an upward dynamic. In several sermons, Augustine makes claims about the importance of the ascension. 
In Sermon 262, he argues that the consequence of Christ's ascension is in the glory of the church, which has been spread all over the world. This sounds nice. And yet I am troubled by this because when I think about what has been spread all over the world in the name of Jesus, I do not see glory. I see gore. I see hate. I see blood on the hands of leaders who have spewed deadly theologies that permeate every facet of our lives. I do not see this glory that Augustine speaks of. I see crucifixion with every anti-trans law that is passed. I see an unhealthy theopolitical landscape. In fact, I am ashamed of what has been spread all over the world. I am embarrassed. Truly, this is not what Jesus had intended. This can't be the point. In Sermon 265c, Augustine preaches that the ascension gives humans an aspirational goal. We must do what is good here on earth in order to obtain a permanent dwelling in heaven. Besides this having negative ecological implications, An unhealthy focus on the eschaton, on the great beyond, has vast repercussions when mishandled. What benefit is there to focus on heaven when there are very real issues in the flesh on earth? I find myself dissatisfied, not sold on the interpretations, frustrated with the mystical comings and goings of Jesus, frustrated by the way modern Christians have platformed heaven while abandoning the teachings of heaven of Jesus that call us to do justice right here on earth. What is the point of all of this? In my frustration... It occurred to me that the point may not be about the significance of the ascension at all, the implications or the interpretations, but perhaps the point is about what happened right before and what happened right after. Before Jesus ascends, he tells the disciples that they will be his witnesses. Following his departure, the disciples are looking up to the sky when suddenly two men dressed in white stand beside him saying, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking at the clouds? When the knuckle-headed disciples don't get the message, the men in white angels perhaps are sent to reinforce. Look, Jesus has called you to bring good news to the poor in his absence. Why do you stand here looking at the sky? Jesus has called you to proclaim release to the captives. Why are you wasting time looking at heaven? There is recovery that needs to take place. There are supremacies that need to be developed. Demolish. Can we get some witnesses up in here? In this transfiguration moment, I imagine the men in white yelling, snap out of it. Release your upward gaze. Why are you staring at the sky? They ask. Over 2,000 years later, we are still being asked the same question. Why do we stand here looking at the sky? Why are we so focused on heaven that we are of no earthly good? Can we get some witnesses up in here? Can we shift our gaze? So many of us have spent our lives looking in the wrong direction for too long. We have spent so much of our journey looking above, looking for escape instead of looking around us. It is not that the upward gaze is wrong, but the lingering is unhealthy. Why do you stand here looking at 
the sky, the men ask. There is an outward gaze that needs to be attended to, a witness that carries the gospel of liberation beyond your immediate circumference to the home and food insecure. There needs to be an outward gaze, a witness that carries the gospel of abolition to the incarcerated. Can we get a witness to carry the gospel of disruption to corrupt political systems? All this debating about the resurrection and ascension, did it happen? Did it really appear? Did the disciples really see his body go into the clouds? And while we are lingering on such things, Jesus is asking us, can I get a witness? There are organizers who need your brain power. Can I get a witness? There are tables that need to be flipped in Arkansas. Can I get a witness up in here? In our witnessing, we are preserving memories and legacies. In our witnessing, we are showing compassion. In our witnessing, we are disrupting dangerous status quos. We are putting our privilege on the line for the sake of justice. We are redistributing wealth and power. And look, witnessing is hard. There are costs to witnessing. You're going to lose some seats at the table. You're going to lose some friends, you'll face persecution, you'll get hate mail, you'll have to lay down your status for the sake of building community. This is what Jesus is calling his disciples to. This is what Jesus is calling us to, the outward gaze, the earthly task at hand. Jesus even tells his disciples that the good news will be taken to Samaria, that their witnessing will transcend the limits of their prejudices. Jesus is saying, could you help liberate even those who may not be in your covenant? Could you help abolish carceral systems that oppress those who will never set foot in your sanctuaries? Could you disrupt dangerous status quos, even for the sake of those who don't look like you, for the sake of those who don't worship like you, for the sake of those who don't like the same music or food you like? Could I get some of those witnesses here? Beloved, as we move through this season, my prayer is that we continually answer the difficult and complex call to witness, to witness beyond the limits of our prejudices, to witness even if it means laying down our statuses. My prayer is that no one has to ask us years from now, why are we looking at the sky? When here, beside us, lies the imago day in every human and creature that surrounds us on this earth. Right here, in the outward gaze, lies incarnate possibilities, an embodied hope, and a renewed call. Let us march forward and witness this season. Let it be so. Amen.
It is through giving that we reach out to our community. It is through giving that we fight the darkness that we still find in our world. It is through giving that we worship our Creator. It is through giving that we feed the hungry and embrace the broken. It is through giving that we deepen our own faith. And it is through giving that we fulfill our mission. You can give to our church in three easy ways. Online through our website, by texting give MPBC to 77977, or by simply mailing a check to our church office. With hearts full of joy, let us give. We take this time to offer our prayers and our thoughts for members of our community of faith and for the world at large. Today, we remember and hold in our hearts and prayers the family of Marcia Carson, who died on April 2nd in St. Petersburg, Florida. Our thoughts and prayers are also with the loved ones of Captain Frank M. Burgess, who died on April 6th in Charlotte, North Carolina. Will you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks and praise for this season of light and hope that shines ever brighter in our darkness and need. Our hearts are burdened, we grow weary of carrying cares for ourselves, our loved ones, and the world. Our flesh is weak from seeking and not finding, of asking and waiting for a door to open, for a sign of relief and release. Jesus, you walk with us. You know our disappointments, our expectations, our struggles, We are not alone. Once more, we look to you, to your life, your promises of abundance and healing. We remember the gift of this life, our call to baptism, the promise of resurrection. Come, create a spirit, strengthen our bodies and renew our minds once more. Nourish us, drench us, fill us with your power so that we may be faithful witnesses to your goodness, mercy, and love, to the ends of the earth, and to your kingdom come. In everything, you have the glory and the praise. In all things, your will be done. 
Amen. receive this benediction. May we be bold and boundless in our call to be witnesses. May we lean into our incarnate possibilities as we move toward justice and care for our community. While we lift up our hearts to God, may we widen our outward gaze for the sake of liberation, for the sake of abolition, for the sake of disruption. And may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us. May God grant us peace and may all who are weary be granted rest. Amen.